Chapter 32, American Life in the Roaring Twenties, 1919 to 1929. Bloodied by the war and disillusioned by the peace, Americans turned inward in the 1920s. Shunning diplomatic commitments to foreign countries, they also denounced radical foreign ideas, condemned un-American lifestyles, and claimed to shut the immigration gates against foreign peoples. They partly sealed off domestic economy from the rest of the world and plunged headlong into a dizzying decade of homegrown prosperity. The boom of the golden twenties showered genuine benefits on Americans as incomes and living standards rose for many, but there seemed to be something incredible about it all, even as people saying, my sister, she works in the laundry, my father sells bootlegger gin, my mother, she takes in the washing, my God, how the money rolls in. New technologies, new consumer products, and new forms of leisure and entertainment made the twenties roar, yet just beneath the surface lurked widespread anxieties about the future and fears that America was losing sight of its traditional ways. Seeing red. Hysterical fears of red Russia continued to color American thinking for several years after the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, which spawned a tiny communist party in America. Tensions were heightened by an epidemic of strikes that convulsed the republic at the war's end, many of them the result of high prices and frustrated union organizing drives. Upstanding Americans jumped to the conclusion that labor troubles were fomented by bomb-and-whisker Bolsheviks. A general strike in Seattle in 1919, though modest in its demands and orderly in its methods, prompted a call from the mayor of federal troops, four of federal troops, to head off the anarchy of Russia. Fire and brimstone evangelists Billy Sunday struck a responsive chord when he described the Bolshevik as a guy with a face like a porcupine and a breath of a scare polecat. If I had my way, I'd fill the jail so full of them that their feet would stick out of the window. The big Red Scare of 1919 and 1920 resulted in a nationwide crusade against left-wingers whose Americanism was suspect. Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer, who saw Red too easily, earned the title of the Quake Fighting Quaker by his excesses of zeal in rounding up suspects. They ultimately totaled about 6,000. This drive to root out radicals was redoubled in June 1919, when a bomb shattered both the nerves and the Washington home of Palmer. The fighting Quaker was thereupon dubbed the Quaking Fighter. Other events highlighted the Red Scare. Late in December 1919, a shipload of 249 alleged alien radicals was deported on the Buford, the Soviet Ark, to the workers' paradise of Russia. One zealot cried, My motto for the Reds is SOS. Ship or shoot. Hysteria was temporarily revived in September 1920 when a still unexplained bomb blast on Wall Street killed 38 people and wounded several hundred others. Various states joined the pack in the outcry against the radicals. In 1919 and 1920, a number of legislatures, reflecting the anxiety of solid citizens, passed criminal syndicalism laws. These anti-red statutes, some of which were born on, of the war, made unlawful the mere advocacy of violence to secure social chains. Critics protested that mere words were not criminal deeds, and that there was a great gulf between throwing fits and throwing bombs, and that free screech was for the nasty as well as for the nice. Violence was done to traditional American concepts of free speech as IWW members and other radicals were vigorously prosecuted. The hysteria went so far that in 1920, five members of the New York legislature, all lawfully elected, were denied their seats simply because they were socialists. The Red Scare was a godsend to conservative business people who used it to break the backs of the fledgling unions. Labor's call for the quote-unquote closed shop or all-union shop was denounced as Sovietism in disguise. Employers in turn held their own anti-union campaign for the open shop as the American plan. Anti-Redism and anti-foreignism were reflected in a notorious case regarding, regarded by liberals as judicial lynching. Nicola Sacco, a shoe factory worker, and Bartolomeu Vanzetti, a fish peddler, were convicted in 1921 of the murder of a Massachusetts paymaster and his guard. The jury and judge were prejudiced in some degree against the defendants because they were Italians, atheists, anarchists, and draft dodgers. Liberals and radicals the world over rallied to the defense of the two aliens doomed to die. The case dragged on for six years until 1927, when the condemned men were electrocuted. Communists and other radicals were thus presented with two martyrs in the class struggle, while many American liberals hung their heads. The evidence against the accused, though damaging, betrayed serious weaknesses. 
If the trial had been held in an atmosphere less charged with anti-reddism, the outcome might have been only a prison term. <clears throat> so a couple questions. There are things to know. Know the Red Scare. Know the Palmer raids. Know about the general strike in 1919. The Wall Street bombing. The Buford de uh, deportation. And definitely know Sacco and Vanzetti and what that meant. And why uh, the Red Scare was good for business. Hoodlums for the KKK. As you read this, keep in mind, this is a, a reborn KKK. It's not just about uh, maintaining a, a black labor force after the Civil War. This is a much more broadened KKK and a much more mainstream KKK, which in the way makes it almost more dangerous. A new Ku Klux Klan, spawned by the post-war reaction, mushroomed fearsomely in the early 1920s. Despite the familiar sheets and hoods, it more closely resembled the anti-foreign nativist movements of the 1850s than the anti-black night writers of the 1860s. It was anti-foreign, anti-Catholic, anti-black, anti-Jewish, anti-pacifist, anti-communist, anti-internationalist, anti-revolutionist, anti-bootlegger, anti-gambling, anti-adultery, and anti-birth control. It was also pro-Anglo-Saxon, pro-quote-unquote Native American, pro-Protestant, and pro-Protestant. In short, the besheeded clan betokened an extremist, ultra-conservative uprising against many of the forces of diversity and modernity that were transforming American culture. As reconstituted, the clan spread with astonishing rapidity, especially in the Midwest and the Bible Belt South. At its peak in the mid-1920s, it claimed about 5 million dues-paying members and wielded potent political influence. It capitalized on the typically American love of the on-the-edge adventure and in-group camaraderie, to say nothing of the adolescent ardor for secret ritual. Knights of the Invisible Empire included among them their official, uh, official imperial wizards, grand goblins, king clagels, and other horrendous creatures. The most impressive displays were the conclaves and, and huge flag-waving parades. The chief warning was the blazing cross. The principal weapon was the bloodied lash, supplemented by tar and feathers. Rallying songs were the fiery cross on high, 100% American, and the Ku Klux Klan and the Pope, against kissing the Pope's toe. One brutal slogan was, kill the kikes, coons, and Catholics. This reign of hooded terror, hooded horror, so repulsive to the best American ideals, collapsed rather suddenly in the late 1920s. Decent people at last recoiled from the orgy of ribboned flesh and terrorism, while scandalously scandals embezzling uh, scandalous embezzling by Klan officials launched a congressional investigation. The bubble was punctured when the movement was exposed as a vicious racket based on a $10 initiation fee, $4 of which was kicked back to local organizers as an incentive to recruit. The KKK was an alarming manifestation of the intolerance and prejudice plaguing people's anxieties and anxious about the dizzying pace of social change in the 1920s. America needed no such cowardly apostles whose white sheets concealed dark purposes. So, big theme here, the dizzying pace of social change and how people respond to it. And the KKK is one of those responses. Stemming the foreign flood. Isolationist America, in the 1920s, ingrown and provincial, had little use for immigrants who began to flood into the country again as peace settled soothingly on the war-torn world. Some 800,000 stepped ashore in 1920-21, to 21, about two-thirds of them from southern and eastern Europe. The 100% Americans, recoiling at the sight of this resumed new immigration, once again cried that the famed poem at the base of the Statue of Liberty was all too literally true. They claimed that a sickly Europe was indeed vomiting on America, quote, the wretched refuse of its teeming shore. Congress temporarily plugged the breach with the Emergency Quota Act of 1921. Newcomers from Europe were restricted in any given year to a def def definite quota, which was set at 3% of the people of their nationality, who had been living in the United States in 1910. This national origins system was relatively favorable to the immigrants from southern and eastern Europe, for by the 1910 immense numbers of them had already arrived. So this stopgap legislation of 1921 was replaced by the Immigrant Act of 1924. Quotas for foreigners were cut from 3% to 2%. The national origins base was shifted from the census of 1910 to that of 1890, when comparatively few Southern Europeans had arrived. Great Britain and Northern Ireland, for example, could send 65,721 a year, as against 5,802 for Italy. Southern Europeans bitterly denounced this device as unfair and discriminatory, a triumph for the nativist belief that blue-eyed and fair-eyed 
Northern Europeans were of better blood. The purpose was clearly to freeze America's existing racial composition, which was largely Northern European. A flagrantly discriminatory section of the Immigration Act of 1924 slammed the door absolutely against Japanese Im immigrants. Mass Hate America rallies erupted in Japan, and one Japanese super patriot expressed his outrage by committing suicide near the American embassy in Tokyo. Exempt from the quota system were Canadians and Latin Americans, whose proximity made them easy to attract for jobs when times were good, and just as easy to send back home when the jobs were not. The quota system affected a pivotal departure in American policy. It claimed that the nation was filling up and that a no-vacancy sign was needed. Immigration henceforth dwindled to a mere trickle. By 1931, probably for the first time in the American experience, more foreigners left than arrived. Quotas thus caused America to sacrifice something of its tradition of freedom and opportunity, as well as its future ethnic diversity. The Immigration Act of 1924 marked the end of an era, a period of virtually unrestricted immigration that in the preceding century had brought some 35 million newcomers to the United States, mostly from Europe. The immigrant tide was now cut off, but it left on American shores by the 1920s <clears throat> a patchwork of ethnic communities separated from each other and from the larger society by language, religion, and customs. Many of the most recent arrivals, including Italians, Jews, and Poles, lived in isolated enclaves with their own houses of worship, newspapers, and theaters. Efforts to organize labor unions repeatedly foundered on the rocks of ethnic differences. Immigrant workers on the same shop floor might share a common interest in wages and working conditions, but they often had no common language with which to form a common cause. Indeed, cynical employers often played upon ethnic rivalries to keep their workers divided and powerless. Ethnic variety thus undermined class and political solidarity. It was an old American story, but one that some reformers hoped would not go on forever. The Prohibition Experiment One of the last peculiar spasms of progressive reform movement was Prohibition, loudly supported by crusading churches and by many women. The arid new order was authorized in 1919 by the 18th Amendment, as implemented by the Volstead Act passed by Congress later that year. Together, these laws made the world safe for hypocrisy. The legal abolition of alcohol was especially popular in the South and the West. Southern whites were eager to keep stimulants out of the hands of blacks, lest they burst out of their place. In the West, prohibition represented an attack on all the vices associated with the ubiquitous Western saloon, public drunkenness, prostitution, corruption, and crime. But despite the overwhelming ratification of the Dry Amendment, strong opposition persisted in the larger eastern cities. For many wet foreign-born people, old-world old style, old styles of sociability were built around drinking in beer gardens and corner taverns. Yet most Americans now assumed that prohibition had come to stay. Everywhere, carousers indulged in the last wild flings as the nation prepared to enter upon a permanent alcohol day. But prohibitionists were naive in the extreme. They overlooked the tenacious American tradition of strong drink and of weak control by the central government, especially over private lives. <clears throat> they forgot that the federal authorities had never satisfactorily enforced a law where the majority of the people, or a strong minority, were hostile to it. They ignored the fact that one cannot make a crime overnight out of something that millions of people have never regarded as a crime. Lawmakers could not legislate away a thirst. Peculiar conditions hampered the enforcement of prohibition. Profound disillusionment <clears throat> over the aftermath of the war raised serious questions as the wisdom of further self-denial. Slaking thirst became a cherished personal liberty, and many ardent wets believed that the way to bring about repeal was to violate the law on a large enough scale. Hypocritical, hip-flask legislators spoke or voted dry while privately drinking wet. Let us strike a blow for liberty was an ironic toast. Frustrated soldiers returning from France complained that prohibition had been put over on them while they were over there. Grimy workers bemoaned the loss of their cheap beer while pointing out that the idle rich could buy all the illicit alcohol they wanted. Flaming youth of the jazz age thought it smart to swill bootleg liquor, liquid tonsil tonsillectomies. Millions of older citizens likewise found forbidden fruit fascinating as they engaged in bar hunts. Prohibition might have started off on better foot if there had been a larger army of enforcement officials, but the state and federal agencies were understaffed and their snoopers, susceptible to bribery, were underpaid. The public was increasingly distressed as scores of people, including innocent bystanders, were killed by quick-triggered dry agents. Prohibition simply did not prohibit. The old-time men-only corner saloons were replaced by thousands of speakeasies, 
each with a tiny grilled window through which the thirsty spoke softly before the barred door was open. Hard liquor, especially the cocktail, was drunk in staggering volumes by both men and women, largely because of <clears throat> the difficulties of transporting and concealing bottles. Beverages of high alcoholic content were popular. Foreign rum runners, often from the West Indies, had their inning and countless cases of liquor leaked down from Canada. The zeal of the American prohibition agents on occasion strained diplomatic relations with Uncle Sam's northern neighbor. Home brew and bathtub gin became popular as law-evading adults engaged in alky cooking with toy stills. The worst of the homemade rot gut produced blindness and even death. <clears throat> the affable bootlegger worked in silent partnership with the friendly undertaker. <clears throat> Yet the noble experiment was not entirely a failure. Bank savings increased, and absenteeism in industry decreased, presumably because of the new sober ways of formerly soused barflies. On the whole, probably less alcohol was consumed than in the days before Prohibition, though strong drink continued to be available. As the legendary Tipler remarked, Prohibition was a darn sight better than no liquor at all. The Golden Age of Gangsterism Prohibition spawned shocking crimes. The lush profits of illegal alcohol led to bribery of the police, many of whom were induced to see and smell no evil. Violent wars broke out in the big cities between rival gangs, often rooted in immigrant neighborhoods, who sought to corner the rich market in booze. Rival triggermen used their sawed-off shotguns and chattering typewriters, machine guns, to erase bootlegging competitors who were trying to muscle in on their racket. In the gang wars of the 1920s in Chicago, about 500 mobsters were murdered. Arrest were few and convictions were even fewer, as the button-lipped gangsters covered one another <clears throat> with the underworld's code of silence. Chicago was by far the most spectacular example of lawlessness. In 1925, Scarface Al Capone, a grasping and murderous booze distributor, began six years of gang warfare that netted him millions of blood-spattered dollars. He zoomed through the streets in an armored-plated car with bulletproof windows. A Brooklyn newspaper quipped, and the pistol's red glare, bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that Chicago's still there. Capone, though branded public enemy number one, could not be convicted of the cold-blooded massacre on St. Valentine's Day in 1929 of seven disarmed members of a rival gang. But after serving most of an 11-year sentence in a federal penitentiary for income tax evasion, he was released as a syphilitic wreck. Gangsters rapidly moved into other profitable and illicit activities, prostitution, gambling, and narcotics. Honest merchants were forced to pay protection money to organized thugs, otherwise their windows would be smashed, their trucks overturned, or their employers or themselves beaten up. Racketeers even evade, invaded the ranks of lo local labor unions as organizers and promoters. Organized crime had come to be one of the nation's most gigantic businesses. By the 1930s, the annual take of the underworld was estimated to be from $12 billion to $18 billion, several times the income of the Washington government. Criminal callousness sank to new deaths in 1932 with the kidnapping for ransom and eventual murder of the infant son of aviator hero Charles A. Lindbergh. The entire nation was inexpressibly shocked and saddened, causing Congress in 1932 to pass the so-called Lindbergh Law by making interstate abduction in certain circumstances a death penalty offense. Monkey Business in Tennessee Education in the 1920s continued to make giant bootstrides. More and more states were requiring young people to remain in school until age 16 or 18, or until graduation from high school. The proportion of 17-year-olds who finished high school almost doubled in the 1920s to more than one in four. The most revolutionary contribution to educational theory during these yeasty years was made by mild manner Professor John Dewey, who served on the faculty of Columbia University from 1904 to 1930. By common contest, no, I'm sorry, by common consent, one of America's few front-raking philosophers, he set forth the principles of learning by doing that formed the foundation of so-called progressive education with its greater permissiveness. He believed that the workbench was as essential as the blackboard and that education for life should be a primary goal of the teacher. Science also scored wondrous advances in these years. A massive public health program launched by the Rockefeller Foundation in the South in 1909 had virtually wiped out the ancient affliction of hookworm by the 1920s. Better nutrition and health care helped to increase the life expectancy of a newborn infant from 50 years in 1901 to 59 years in 1929. Yet, both science and progressive education in the 1920s were subjected to unfriendly fire from the fundamentalists. These old-time religionists charged that teaching 
The teaching of Darwin's evolution was destroying faith in God and the Bible while contributing to the moral breakdown of youth in the Jazz Age. Numerous attempts were made to secure laws prohibiting the teaching of evolution. The bestial hypothesis in public schools in three southern states adopted such shackling measures. The trio of states included Tennessee in the heart of the so-called Bible Belt, where the spirit of evangelical religion was still robust. The stage was set for the memorable monkey trial at the hamlet of Dayton in eastern Tennessee in 1925. A likable high school biology teacher named John T. Scopes was indicted for teaching evolution. Batteries of newspaper reporters, armed with notebooks and cameras, descended upon the quiet town to witness the spectacle. Scopes was defended by nationally known attorneys, while former presidential candidate William Jennings Bryan, an ardent Presbyterian fundamentalist, joined the prosecution. Taking the stand as an expert on the Bible, Bryan was made appear foolish by the famed criminal lawyer Clarence Darrow. Five days after the trial was over, Bryan died of a stroke no doubt brought on by the wilting heat and the witness stand strain. This historic clash between theology and biology proved inconclusive. Scopes, the forgotten man of the drama, was found guilty and fined $100. But the Supreme Court of Tennessee, while upholding the law, set aside the fine on a technicality. The fundamentalist, at best, won only a hollow victory, for the absurdities of the trial cast ridicule on the cause. Yet even though increasing numbers of Christians were coming to reconcile the revelations of religion, with the findings of modern science, fundamentalism, with its emphasis on literal reading of the Bible, remained a vibrant force in American spiritual life. It was especially strong in the, church, the Baptist Church and the rapidly growing Churches of Christ organized in 1906. The Mass Consumption Economy Prosperity, real, sustained, and widely shared, put much of the roar into the 20s. The economy kicked off its war harness in 1990, faltered a few steps in the recession of 1920-21, and then sprinted forward for nearly seven years. Both the recent war and Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon's tax policies favored the rapid expansion of capital investment. Ingenious machines, powered by relatively cheap energy from newly tapped oil fields, dramatically increased the productivity of the laborer. Assembly line production reached such perfection in Henry Ford's famed Rouge plant near Detroit that a finished automobile emerged every 10 seconds. Great new industries suddenly sprouted forth. Such supplying electrical power for the humming new machines became a giant business in the 1920s. Above all, the automobile, once the horseless chariot of the new or the rich, now became the carriage of the common citizen. By 1930, Americans owned almost 30 million cars. The nation's deepening love affair with the automobile headlined a momentous shift in the character of the economy. American manufacturers seemed to have mastered the problems of production. The worries now focused on consumption. Could they find the mass markets for the goods they have contrived to spew forth in such profusion? Responding to this need, a new arm of American commerce came into being, advertising. By persuasion and ploy, seduction and sexual suggestion, advertisers sought to make Americans chronically discontented with their paltry possessions and want more, more, more. A founder of this new profession was Bruce Barton, prominent New York partner in a Madison Avenue firm. In 1925, Barton published a bestseller, The Man Nobody Knows, setting forth the, provocation, the provocative thesis that Jesus Christ was the greatest ad man of all time. Every advertising man ought to study the parables of Jesus, Barton preached. They are marvelously condensed, as all good advertising should be. Barton even had a good word to say for Christ's executive ability. He picked up 12 men from the bottom ranks of business and forged them into an organization that conquered the world. He said it like that because it was the 20s. Sports became big business in the consumer economy of the 1920s. Ballyhooed by the image makers, home run heroes like George H. Babe Ruth were far better known than most statesmen. The fans bought tickets in such numbers that Babe's hometown park, Yankee Stadium, became known as the house that Ruth built. In 1921, the slugging heavyweight champion Jack Dempsey knocked out the dapper French lightweight Georges Carpentier. The Jersey City crowd in attendance had paid more than a million dollars, the first in a series of million-dollar gates in the golden 1920s. Buying on credit was another innovative feature of the post-war economy. Possess today and pay tomorrow was the message directed at buyers. Once frugal descendants of Puritans went ever deeper into debt to own all kinds of newfangled marvels, refrigerators, vacuum cleaners, and especially cars and radios. Prosperity thus accumulated an overhanging cloud of debt, and the economy became increasingly vulnerable to disruptions of the credit structure. Putting America on rubber tires. A new industrial revolution slipped into high gear in the America of the 1920s. 
Thrusting out steel tentacles, it changed the daily life of the people in unprecedented ways. Machinery was the new messiah, and the automobile was its principal prophet. Of all the inventions of the era, the automobile cut the deepest mark. It heralded an amazing new industrial system based on assembly line methods and mass production techniques. Americans adapted rather adapted, sorry, rather than invented the gasoline engine. Europeans can claim the original honor. By the 1890s, a few daring American inventors and promoters, including Henry Ford and Ransom E. Olds of Oldsmobile, were developing the infant automobile industry. By 1910, 69 car companies rolled out a total annual production of 181,000 units. The early contraptions were neither speedy nor reliable. Many a stalled motorist, profanely cranked a bulky automobile, had to endure the jeer, get a horse, from the occupants of a passing Dobbin-drawn Dob carriage. An enormous industry sprang into being as Detroit became the motor car capital of America. The mechanized colossus owned much to the stopwatch efficiency techniques of Frederick W. Taylor, a prominent inventor, engineer, and tennis player who sought to eliminate wasted motion. His epitaph reads, Father of Scientific Management. Best known of the new crop of industrial wizards was Henry Ford, who, more than any other individual, put America on rubber tires. His high and hideous Model T Tin Lizzie was cheap, rugged, and reasonably reliable, though rough and clattering. The parts of Ford's flivver were highly standardized, but the behavior of this rattling good car was so eccentric that it became the butt of num numberless jokes. Lean and silent Henry Ford, who was said to have wheels in his head, erected an immense personal empire on the cornerstone of his mechanical genius, though his associates provided much of the organizational talent. Ill-educated, this multimillionaire mechanic was socially and culturally narrow. History is bunk, he once testified, but he dedicated himself with one-track devotion to the gospel of standardization. After two early failures, he grasped and applied fully the techniques of assembly line production, Fordism. He is supposed to have remarked that the purchaser could have his automobile any color he desired, just as long as it was black. So economical were his methods that in the mid-1920s he was selling the Ford Roadster for $260, well within the purse of a thrifty worker. The flood of Fords was phenomenal. In 1914, the automobile wizard turned out his 500,000th car. 500,000th car. Model T. By 1930, his total had risen to 20 million, or on a bumper-to-bumper -bumper basis, more than enough to encircle the globe. A national newspaper had, uh, and magazine poll conducted in 1923 revealed Ford to be the people's choice for the presidential nomination in 1924. By 1929, when the great bull market collapsed, 26 million motor vehicles were registered in the United States. This figure, averaging one for every 4.9 Americans, represented far more automobiles than existed in all the rest of the world. The advent of the gasoline age. The impact of the self-propelled carriage on various aspects of American life was tremendous. A gigantic new industry emerged, dependent on steel but displacing steel from its kingpin role. Employing directly or indirectly about six million people by 1930, it was a major wellspring of the nation's prosperity. Thousands of new jobs, however, were created by supporting industries. The lengthening list would include rubber, glass, and fabrics, to say nothing of highway construction and thousands of service stations and garages. America's standard of living responded to this infectious vitality rose to an enviable level. New industries bloomed lustily. Older ones grew sickly. The petroleum business experienced an explosive development. Hundreds of oil derricks shot up in California, Texas, and Oklahoma, as these states expanded wondrously and the wilderness frontier became an industrial frontier. The once feared railroad octopus, on the other hand, was hard hit by the competition of passenger cars, buses, and trucks. An age-old story was repeated. One industry's gains were another industry's pains. Others felt the effects other effects were widely felt. Speedy marketing of perishable foodstuffs such as fresh fruits was accelerated. A new prosperity enriched outlying farms as city dwellers were provided with produce at attractive prices. Countless new roads ribboned out to meet the demand of the American motorist for smoother and faster highways, often paid for by taxes on gasoline. The era of mud ended as the nation made haste to construct the finest network of hard surface roadways in the world. Lured by sophisticated advertising and encouraged by tempting installment plan buying, countless Americans with shallow purses acquired the habit of riding as they paid. Zooming motor cars were agents of social change. At first a luxury, they rapidly became a necessity. Essentially devices needed uh, devices for transportation, they soon developed into a badge of freedom and equality, a necessary prop for self-respect. To some, ostentation seemed more important than transportation. 
Leisure hours could not be spent more pleasurably as tens of thousands of cooped up souls responded to the call of the open road on joy riding vacations. Women were further freed from cl clinging vine dependence on men. Isolation among the sections was broken down and the less attractive states lost population at an alarming rate. By the late 1920s, Americans owned more automobiles than bathtubs. I can't go to town in a bathtub, one homemaker explained. Other social byproducts of the automobile were visible. Autobuses made possible the consolidation of schools and to some extent of churches. The sprawling suburbs spread out still farther from the urban core as America became a nation of commuters. The demon machine, on the other hand, exacted a terrible toll by catering to the American mania for speed. Citizens were becoming statistics. Not counting the hundreds of thousands of injured and crippled, the one millionth America had American had died in a motor vehicle accident by 1951, more than all those killed on all the battlefields of all the nation's wars to that date. The public be rammed seemed to be the motto of the new age. <clears throat> Virtuous home life partially broke down as joyriders of all ages forsook the parlor for the highway. The morals of flaming youth sagged correspondingly, at least in the judgment of their elders. What might young people get up to in the privacy of a close-top Model T? An Indiana juvenile court judge voiced parents' worst fears when he condemned the automobile as a house of prostitution on wheels. Even the celebrated crime waves of the 1920s and 1930s were aided and abetted by the motor car, for gangsters can now make quick getaways. Yet no sane American would plead for a return of the old horse and buggy, <clears throat> complete with fly-breeding manu fly manure. The automobile contributed notably to the improved air and environmental quality, despite its later notoriety, notoriety as a polluter. Life might be cut short on the highways and smog might poison the air, but the automobile brought more convenience, pleasure, and excitement into more people's lives than almost any other single invention. Humans develop wings. Gasoline engines also provided the power that enabled humans to fulfill the age-old dream of sprouting wings. After near successful experiments by others with heavier-than-air craft, the Wright brothers, Over and Wilbur, performed a miracle at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. On a historic day, December 17, 1903, Orville Wright took aloft a feebly engined plane that stayed airborne for 12 seconds and 120 feet. Thus, the air age was launched by two obscured bicycle repairmen. As aviation gradually got off the ground, the world slowly shrank. The public was made increasingly air-minded by unsung heroes, often martyrs, who appeared as stunt flyers at fairs and other public gatherings. Airplanes, or flying coffins, were used to mark the success, with marked success for various purposes during the Great War of 1914 to 1918. Shortly thereafter, private companies began to operate passenger lines with airmail contracts, which were in effect a subsidy from Washington. The first transcontinental airmail route was established from New York to San Francisco in 1920. In 1927, modest and skillful Charles A. Lindbergh, the so-called flying fool, electrified the world by the first solo westy east conquest of the Atlantic. Seeking a prize of $25,000, the lanky stunt flyer courageously piloted his single-engine plane, the Spirit of St. Louis, from New York to Paris in a grueling 36 hours and 39 minutes. Lindbergh's exploits swept Americans off their feet. Fed up with the cynicism and debunking of the Jazz Age, they found in this wholesome and handsome youth a genuine hero. They clasped the soaring Lone Eagle to their hearts much more warmly than the bashful young man desired. Lucky Lindy received an uproarious welcome in the Hero Canyon of Lower Broadway, as 1,800 tons of ticker tape and other improvised confetti showered upon him. Lindbergh's achievement, it was more than a stunt, did much to dramatize and popularize flying, while giving a strong boost to the infant aviation industry. <clears throat> the impact of the airmen was tremendous. <clears throat> it provided the restless American spirit with yet another dimension. At the same time, it gave birth to a giant new industry. Unfortunately, the accident rate in the pioneer stages of aviation was high, though hardly more so than on early railroads. But by the 1930s and the 1940s, travel by air on regularly scheduled airlines was significantly safer than on many overcrowded highways. Humanity's new wings also increased the tempo of an already breathless civilization. The Floundering Railroad received another setback through the loss of passengers and mail. A lethal new weapon was given to the gods of war, and with the coming of the city-busting aerial bombs, people could well debate whether the conquest of the air was a blessing or a curse. The Atlantic Ocean was shriveling to about the size of the Aegean Sea in the days of Socrates, while isolation was being behind ocean moats was becoming a bygone dream. All right, so I'm out of time. I'm in class. Hello, guys. I'm in class right now, so hopefully you'll listen to this. But I'm out of time, but I'm not suggesting you stop reading. Please finish the next couple of pages for full credit. There you go, Rob.